cursory glance at YouTube in the year 2018 will instantly reveal that there is no shortage of content as it relates to red pill matters concerning men, women, MGTOW, and similar topics. Indeed, it would be no exaggeration to say that there is a glut of content covering such things. Something that has become blatantly clear to me over the years is that some things are never entirely said and done, meaning, to some extent, that repetition is required, if only because there will always be men who don't have the knowledge and experience that men do who have walked before them have accumulated. This is particularly true of young men who, in the majority, will inevitably seek out contact with women and can be easily confused by the behavior they observe on display. They will just be following their nature. Few of them will want to isolate themselves completely and avoid women entirely. It is for this reason and their sake that in this video, I want to approach some basics from a more nuanced perspective on one of the most important interaction points between men and women, namely love or falling in love. More critically, how women experience these things. The first thing every man should understand in his interaction with women, in particular young men, is that the concept of love or falling in love is categorically different for women than it is for men. The image or metaphor I would use here is that of a painting. The woman approaches the man with a painting, but this picture lacks a canvas and frame. The man in this context is the canvas and frame onto which the female in question grafts the preconceived and fully completed painting. The grafting of the painting onto the canvas and frame essentially describes a process of projection. Love and attraction for most women are based upon a projected ideal. Men, by way of contrast, operate far more on visual cues, whereby physical criteria are most important. There can be desired physical attributes, but the critical difference is that women begin the interaction with a complete preconceived notion of what is desirable. This notion is then attached to an external source, which is the man. Hence the metaphor of the complete painting lacking a canvas and frame. The man represents the theoretical completion of the painting, but I say theoretical because it is almost invariably a temporary conjunction and is likely ultimately to be dissolved because the projection rarely matches the reality is projected onto. In this sense, there is an ideal in the mind of the female, a picture, as described above, of what the perfect man would be, or at least the man that best lines up with the projection she is making. The female account is therefore not a moment-to-moment -moment experience based evaluation of compatibility, but rather one in which the qualities and quantities are pre-assigned, and the man is required to match those qualities and quantities. Another common way of phrasing it is the laundry list, the list that she ticks off one by one, an ideal projected outward onto the man. The most salient factor to point out here is that the picture begins fully completed, and here is where the real challenge comes in. It is the man's task to maintain the integrity of the picture once he, the frame and canvas, have been grafted onto it. He becomes and is the picture, and yet he is not. And how well he conforms to the expectation, ideals, and projections that created the painting in the first place are the main grounds for the maintenance of this fading picture of love. The default starting point is the perfection of the woman's projection, which you, the man, must conform and adhere to, not your actual qualities, and inasmuch as you do correlate with what she envisions, then you might be in relative luck, but regardless, the picture was never something that you are or were, for the painting had been painted in a fantasy world that the man has to live up to subsequently. The very real consequence of this is that every man who engages in serious romantic encounters with women is fighting both a battle against time and a battle to preserve a fantasy that he may or may not be, and in most cases, the painting of reality begins to fade as the colors grow dull, the details are lost, and the man resembles less and less what the woman had thought he was. He is in a constant struggle to maintain the utopian vision that had forged the picture in the first place, and will likely fail as a mere consequence of time at doing so. In previous discussion, I have made reference to the female point of view as a film, with a distinct beginning and end. Once the film is over, so too is the relationship. When the ability of the man to preserve the fantasy of the female embodied in the painting can no longer be sustained, and the details of the painting lose all bearing to the painter's vision, i.e. the woman's, the painting is freed from the frame and canvas it was assigned to, and the fantasy is re-established to be applied elsewhere, i.e. to another man who will undergo the same vetting process, and in all likelihood fail precisely because the painting was painted onto a chimerical foundation to begin with and not rooted in reality. Wishes sought to be fulfilled, but likely cannot, because they stem from conceit rather than from what is. 
This is why typically, when you ask women why they are together with man or men X, the answer forthcoming is almost always self-referential, e.g., I like the way he makes me feel, he makes me feel secure, he does this for me, etc. Any citation of a quality will coincide with the degree to which he matches the painting he has been integrated into. Because the relationship is predicated on fantasy, and the fantasy is born of one mind, the only point of reference is that mind, meaning the woman's mind, hence why the man only exists in the context of the painting she has painted. Of course, even women can be torn away from their fantasies, and as often happens as they approach the wall, the picture they have painted simply becomes less and less complex because reality in such cases puts temporal pressure on them to act. However, the coming resentment factor stems from the fact that she knows that the frame and canvas that she is now grafting onto her picture does not fit the picture, and even the initial amalgamation of the fantasy picture that is her projection is already worn for wear as she knowingly settles for someone who had never even approached the dimensions of the painting to begin with. This is why settling results in bitterness, anger, and resentment, because the requirements were fantastical at the outset and could have never been met. It's akin to being disappointed that reality is not like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory, when all you've done has been feeding yourself reels of footage from it, and you run out and notice that the world is not laden with sweets. The incorporation of reality into a sought-after fantasy will always fail, because the fantasy has no limits, and reality does. The only way to bypass this is to remove the painting from its lofty place in the heavens, or to remove it completely, which may be possible, but nonetheless very, very difficult. In the end, it is far more likely that the painting will fade, and the film reel will run out, and it will be as if you, the man, had never acted in the film or been part of the landscape, a memory disconnected from the present in any relevant way. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.